to the graphic nature of this murder case, listener discretion is advised. This episode includes dramatizations and discussions of sexual assault of children and violence against children. We advise extreme caution for children under 13. December 3rd, 1957 was a big day for the children of Sycamore, Illinois. The papers said to expect snow that night, the first big snowfall of the winter. All along the neat suburban streets, eager faces pressed up against windows, searching for the first flakes. But 11-year-old Chuck Riddolf was too grown up for that. Even as his younger sister bounded outside to play, he opted to stay in the den listening to music and shuffling through baseball cards. Chuck got lost in the sound for an hour or so and occasionally got up to flip the record and glance at the swirling snow. The boy heard a knock and jumped up to answer the door. His sister, seven-year-old Maria Ridolf, probably needed to grab another toy. But Maria wasn't there. Instead, it was her best friend, eight-year-old Kathy Sigmund. The young girl looked perplexed. She said she couldn't find Maria anywhere. Chuck thought nothing of it. Maria wandered off all the time. He sent Kathy away. Five minutes later, the little girl came back. Tears clung to her ruddy cheeks. She still couldn't find Maria. The 11-year-old sighed and pulled on his boots. He checked the alleyway and called his sister's name. There was no response. Something was very wrong. Chuck ran back to the house to alert his parents. He failed to notice the impressions in the snow just a few feet away. There were two sets of footprints, one smaller than the other. They plodded along side by side for a few meters, and suddenly the child-sized tracks disappeared. These tiny prints were the last anyone would see of Maria. And her loved ones would spend a lifetime wondering who walked beside her. This is our first episode on Maria Riddolf. This week we'll cover Maria's disappearance in 1957 and the 40 years of investigation that followed. Next week we'll track down one of the main suspects and maybe solve one of the coldest cases in American history. On the first Tuesday of December, 1957, seven-year-old Maria Riddolf walked home from school with her best friend, eight-year-old Kathy Sigmund. Both girls had lived in the Chicago suburb of Sycamore, Illinois, as long as they could remember. It was an easy town to grow up in, with a population around 7,000 and low crime rate. Maria, who was in second grade, and Kathy, who was in third, walked to and from school together nearly every day. December 3rd, 1957, was no different. The girls shuffled across the street to Maria's house and left their heavy coats and boots by the doorway. It felt like snow was coming, and they rushed up to Maria's room to cut out paper snowflakes. When 5 p.m. rolled around, Kathy grabbed her book bag and headed to her house for dinner. She lived a few houses down and promised to come back later. The air felt sharp. Snow had to be on the way. After Kathy left, the Riddle family sat down to eat. It was Maria's favorite, roast rabbit, carrots, potatoes, and a big glass of milk. She was just starting in on the vegetables when the snow finally arrived. The second grader couldn't help but smile. It felt like this day couldn't get any better. As soon as she finished, Maria popped out of her chair and begged her mother to go outside with Kathy. The seven-year-old played outside by herself all the time, so the answer was easy. Oh, I don't see why not, as long as her mother allows it. But it is a school night, so be sure to come back soon and wear your good socks. Kathy's mother was strict, so asking her to play was always a bit of a gamble. But when Maria called her friend around 6 p.m., it was an immediate yes. No parent would deprive their child of the year's first snowfall. Kathy didn't even need to do her chores before she went outside that night. A few minutes later, the girls met each other at one of their favorite spots, a giant elm tree at the corner of Center Cross Street and Archie Place. 
The snow had really picked up in the last half hour. The whole block looked mysterious and magical. And the sun had just set. That meant it was time for Maria and Kathy's favorite game, which they called Duck the Cars. One of the girls would stand on the curb in the dark and wait to see a car's headlights coming down the road. She had to stay on the curb for as long as she could while the beams came closer. Then at the last minute, she'd run for the tree and try to get behind it before the headlights hit her. They alternated back and forth, sprinting for the tree and giggling when one didn't make it in time. Several neighbors, as well as Maria's mother, saw the girls playing like this between 6 p.m. and 6.30. After about 30 minutes outside, Kathy began to shiver. She'd forgotten her mittens at home. Maria seemed fine, though, in her fuzzy coat and black corduroys. Even though Maria was a year younger than Kathy, she was the leader in their friendship. Other kids always said she was the pretty one, with her big brown eyes and curly hair. Kathy was quieter and less assertive, so if Maria didn't complain about the cold, Kathy wouldn't either. Just as their game of duck the cars started to wind down, the girls noticed a tall man walking toward them. The girls didn't recognize this man, but they weren't nervous. Kathy later described him as blonde, with his hair swept back into a stylish ducktail. He had a narrow face and wore a bright patterned sweater. Maria said hello and asked the man to introduce himself. He said his name was Johnny, and Kathy was struck by how high and reedy his voice sounded. She also noticed his large teeth. They might have had a gap in the front, but she wasn't sure. They chatted with Johnny for a few minutes. He said he was 24 years old and unmarried. The children thought he'd move along after that, but he stuck around. Then Johnny asked a question that would haunt Kathy for years. Would you girls like a piggyback ride? Kathy's stomach sank. She didn't like the idea of getting on a strange man's back. But Maria, who'd always been a bit more adventurous, said yes on the spot. She latched onto Johnny's back and stayed there as he took her about 20 feet down the block, turned around, and came back. As he crouched down to let Maria off, he asked Kathy if she wanted a ride, too. Kathy still felt shy and said no. He changed tactics. Okay, then. Do you girls like playing with dollies? I can play dollies with you. Eight-year-old Kathy stayed silent, but seven-year-old Maria was excited by the new playmate. She ran home to grab her dolls, which left Kathy alone with Johnny. Maria burst into the living room and said hello to her father, who was watching a Western on TV. She dashed upstairs to pick up her favorite doll, but was stopped by her mother on the way out. Maria, no, you're going to ruin your pretty cloth doll out in the snow. Take the rubber one instead. The seven-year-old followed her mother's instructions, said a quick goodbye to her brother, and scooted out the door. That was the last time anyone in the Riddle family saw her alive. Maria was relieved to see Johnny and Kathy still standing at the corner of Archie Place and Center Cross Street. Kathy hadn't talked with Johnny much when Maria was gone. He offered the eight-year-old a piggyback ride again, but she declined. Then he asked if she'd like to take a walk around the neighborhood or go on a trip somewhere. She stuffed her hands into her pockets and said no. The older girl was relieved to see her friend coming back to the big elm tree, but Maria seemed more interested in Johnny. The seven-year-old showed the man her rubber doll and asked to ride on his back one more time. He smiled and crouched down. While the other two loped down the street, Kathy realized that she needed to do something about her sore, freezing hands. She tried to get Maria's attention as she dismounted and whispered that she needed to go home for some mittens. She asked Maria if she wanted to come with, but Maria was busy with the doll and said she didn't want to. Kathy asked Johnny what time it was. He glanced at his watch and said it was 7 p.m. It's unclear if this time was correct, though. Johnny could have said any time of night and the girls would have believed him. 
This question would become important later in the investigation. When Kathy came inside and asked her mother for permission to keep playing, Mrs. Sigmund looked at the clock and saw that it was 6.55. It was getting late and Kathy would need to be in bed soon, but Mrs. Sigmund allowed her to play in the snow just a little longer. Finally warm, Kathy headed toward the elm tree. She squinted and tried to find Maria's silhouette in the smooth white landscape. Strangely, Kathy couldn't see Johnny either, and his tall, lanky figure was a lot harder to hide. Kathy jogged toward the corner. Maybe Maria was playing an especially long round of Duck the Cars. But when eight-year-old Kathy got to the elm tree, Maria Ridolph was nowhere to be found. Coming up, the entire town bands together to find Maria. And eventually, they make a grisly discovery. And now, back to the story. Eight-year-old Kathy Sigmund ran up and down the suburban streets of Sycamore, Illinois, on December 3, 1957. She was looking for her best friend, seven-year-old Maria Ridolph, who'd seemingly disappeared into the snow just moments before. The third grader screamed her best friend's name over and over, but there was no response. Eventually, the little girl turned around and knocked on Maria's family's door. Maria's brother, 11-year-old Chuck Ridolf, initially dismissed her. He told her to check their favorite spots again. The older boy knew that Maria wandered off a lot. Just last year, his family had been convinced she'd gone missing. As soon as they got a search party together, the young girl came back home. She'd been playing at Elmwood Cemetery a few blocks away. But this time seemed different. Kathy was hysterical, babbling to Chuck about a strange man, mittens and piggyback rides. This time, he went outside to search for himself and made sure to look around Elmwood Cemetery. No sign of Maria. Concerned, he returned home to tell his parents. Kathy, meanwhile, ran back to her house and breathlessly related the story to her mother. From there, Mrs. Sigmund and Maria's mother, Frances, got in touch over the phone and began putting the pieces of Kathy's story together. At first, the Ridolfs weren't sure that they should contact the police. Johnny sounded creepy, but the family didn't want to be embarrassed again. They trusted that Kathy had embellished the story and that Maria would come home soon. Maria's parents called on their neighbors to survey the area. They searched for an hour, but it was fruitless. Frances couldn't wait any longer. At 8.10 p.m., she finally reported her daughter as missing. She feared something even worse. Kidnapping. The Sycamore Police Department didn't have much experience with missing children in 1957. Hardly anyone locked their doors in the quiet Chicago suburb. The small-town cops knocked on every door in the city. They asked if anyone had seen Maria. As more residents heard the story, they insisted on helping with the search. By 9 p.m., a few hundred men and boys were walking the streets, some armed with shotguns. They checked every house, motel room, bus station, and railroad car in the area, and set up roadblocks to check cars going in and out of the city. Some residents remember December 3rd, 1957, as one of the scariest nights in Sycamore's history. Still, they didn't find Maria. This massive effort wasn't entirely in vain, though. Two of Maria's siblings found another key piece of evidence near their home. It was Maria's rubber doll, left on the edge of a neighbor's property. Strangely, the area had already been searched by police. The doll wasn't there before. It looked like someone had planted it. The police also found the mysterious footprints in an alley behind Archie Place. It looked like an adult had lured little Maria away and picked her up, which caused her footprints to disappear. There were tire marks near the spot where the little girl's footprints vanished. The snow was too slushy on the roads to follow the car's path. 
They worried that Maria was already out of Sycamore. She might even be headed out of the state. Sycamore was still in a panic as the sun rose on December 4th, 1957. The fresh blanket of snow had felt so festive the night before, but now it looked sinister, like it covered a dark secret. Maria's round, smiling face was plastered all over newspapers in the greater Chicago area. Headlines like, Missing Girl, Seven, Feared Kidnapped, loomed above. Frances Ridolph was interviewed by a TV news crew. She stared directly into the camera and delivered a message to both her daughter and the man who took her away. If the person who kidnapped Maria is listening, it couldn't have been done in malice. It was a little mistake, and God forgives mistakes. If you do the right thing, we would forgive you too. Just bring her home. And Maria, if you're watching, don't cry. Above all, don't cry. Don't make a fuss. We'll be with you soon. Francis knew that Maria was naturally anxious and could get hysterical when things went wrong. She said that Maria was a, quote, screamer and worried that the kidnapper might choke or otherwise harm her to keep her quiet. As the word spread, search efforts continued. Local high schoolers were excused from class and wandered the area. The search teams opened up manholes and checked under cars. They watched silently as Lake Sycamore was drained, worried that Maria's body would float to the surface. A horse riding club sent their best riders to check the fields and forested areas, and a military plane circled above. But no more physical evidence turned up. All of it had been trampled in the snow. The police chief quickly realized his department was out of its depth. If Marie was kidnapped, he assumed that she might be crossing state lines soon. He called the Chicago branch of the FBI. Dozens of agents were dispatched to Sycamore, where they set up a temporary headquarters at a local motel. FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover demanded updates and communicated directly with Special Agent Richard Auerbach, who led the investigation. President Dwight D. Eisenhower also followed the case. Auerbach sent Maria's doll to the FBI lab in Washington, D.C. for analysis. He also sent some of the girl's belongings, including a hairbrush, school books, a toy oven, and her favorite nursery rhyme records. The Riddle family thought the kidnapper would demand a ransom soon. They typed out a script for how to respond to a ransom call and taped it next to the phone in case one of the children answered. This turned out to be useless. Maria's abductor never contacted the family. The kidnapper didn't seem to want money, so the FBI worried that Maria had been taken by a sexual predator. Agents were directed to look into all known sexual deviants in the area, and tips began to rush in. Soon they had a staggering list. It seemed like everyone in Sycamore thought they knew a peeping Tom or sex offender. Unfortunately, many of these tips were simply men suspected of being gay. The overwhelming amount of tips wasted precious investigation time and resources. The only real witness that the FBI could interview was eight-year-old Kathy Sigmund, who had been with Maria moments before she disappeared. Her description of Johnny remained consistent through multiple interviews. Kathy's description of Johnny was published on wanted posters and in newspapers. According to her, he was a white man between 24 and 30 and about 5 foot 8. Soon, a whole new wave of tips rushed in. Every young, blonde man in the area became a suspect. Without much physical evidence, the entire investigation relied on Kathy's eyewitness account. The eight-year-old's mother frequently reminded her of just how important her brief memory was. You need to remember his face, Kathy. Just hold on to it in your mind. You're the only one who knows what he looks like. You're the only one who can save her. The attention overwhelmed the eight-year-old. Reporters swarmed as police escorted her into the station day after day to look at photographs of possible suspects. Doctors examined her to be sure she wasn't abused by Johnny. Her home was put under 24-hour police surveillance. 
Kathy estimates that she was shown thousands of mugshots, but none of them look like Johnny. The investigation was faltering. By December 15th, the FBI had looked into 200 suspects. They still had more than 100 leads to work through, but the prospects looked grim. A supervisor from the Chicago FBI office wrote a memo to Hoover and described the issues. While we only know a portion of the memo's contents, based on other circumstances at the time, it could have read something like this. Our temporary office at the Golden Harvest Motel in Sycamore has been functioning for two weeks. Per diem cost for 29 agents is $3,600. More than 250 leads have been followed and more than 1,000 individuals interviewed, all with negative results. Every day it seems less likely that we will find Miss Riddolf alive, and we may soon direct more resources toward the recovery of her remains. Hoover responded to this memo personally saying, quote, This case must receive continuous, aggressive, imaginative, investigative attention. But the truth was unavoidable. The case was going cold. There was a brief moment of excitement, though. On December 22, 1957, Kathy finally saw a photo she recognized as Johnny. The man's real name was Thomas Rivard. He was 35 years old, which put him outside of the date range that Kathy originally gave. He was also much shorter than she'd estimated Johnny to be, only about five foot four. The detectives were ecstatic when the girl pointed him out, but it was short-lived. Six people saw Thomas Rivard working at a farm near Madison, Wisconsin, on the night of the kidnapping, so it was impossible for him to be the culprit. There were a few other suspects that seemed promising. A trucker named Donald Arbuckle had been in the area on December 3rd and was later accused of abducting another young girl, but Kathy didn't recognize him. A local factory worker named Johnny Hilburn admitted to talking to a pair of young girls on the night of December 3rd. Hilburn was convicted of molesting his five-year-old daughter a month after Maria disappeared. He refused to take a polygraph test and hired a lawyer the moment the FBI started asking questions. But Kathy didn't recognize him either. One of Maria's neighbors, an 18-year-old dropout named John Tessier, matched Kathy's description of Johnny perfectly. He seemed like a prime suspect, but his parents gave him an alibi. The teenager passed a polygraph test, so his photo was never shown to Kathy. Detectives worried that Kathy was losing the mental image of Johnny. They asked her to give a description again, and it was similar to the one she'd originally offered. Perhaps they just hadn't shown the right photo yet, or they tossed out the real kidnapper's photo by accident. As Christmas of 1957 rolled around, the Riddle family still held out hope that their daughter would return. Maria's mother bought her a typewriter and wrapped it under the tree, as if that might lure her daughter back. But the Christmas miracle they'd hoped for didn't come. In fact, the holiday marked an unofficial end to the FBI's investigation. Agents went home to be with their families, and few returned for the new year. The story that had gripped the nation only a few weeks before was going nowhere. Kathy Sigmund continued to be questioned throughout the spring of 1958, but didn't recognize any photos. Five months passed with no movement in the case. Then on April 26, 1958, a retired couple went on a day hike near Galena, Illinois. They were about 90 miles away from Sycamore in a wooded area just off State Route 20. They pushed through thick brambles and looked under fallen trees for the spongy heads of morel mushrooms. The man crouched down to look under a large nurse log and saw what looked like the bones of a baby deer. By the time his wife came over to get a better look, the man realized that the skeleton had clothes on, children's clothes. The couple raced out of the woods, banged on the door of a farmhouse nearby, and begged to use their phone. They called the sheriff's office, and soon enough, deputies were pushing through the brush to see it for themselves. One name echoed through their minds, 
Maria Ridolf. The body had been picked apart by birds and animals, but there were still a few identifying features left. Dark hair clung to the dried-out skull, and a jacket lay nearby. The body had a black-and-white flannel shirt, an undershirt, and brown socks on. There were no pants on or near it. Frances Ridolph recognized the clothes as Maria's. She pointed out the patch she'd sewn onto the flannel shirt and remembered the size and brand of her daughter's socks. For a final confirmation, detectives took impressions and matched them up with dental records. It was Maria. The coroner wasn't able to determine a cause of death. He labeled it suspected foul play and didn't go into any more detail. There weren't any photos taken at the crime scene either to preserve the family's privacy. The seven-year-old was finally laid to rest on a warm day later in the spring of 1958. Her friend Kathy was surrounded by police as she watched the small white casket go into the ground. Because Maria's body was found in Illinois, the FBI had to drop the case. They only handled federal cases, and Maria didn't cross state lines. Illinois State Police took over, but hit the same dead ends that the FBI ran into. Leads slowly petered out and new tips stopped coming in. After about two years, the case was abandoned. Detectives continued to show photo lineups to Kathy Sigmund until 1961, when she was about 12 years old. Still, no Johnny. Even as trips to the police station became less frequent, Kathy was troubled by that December night. She became an outcast at school, and parents wouldn't let their children play with or talk to her. She kept the image of Johnny firmly in her head and constantly felt the need to glance behind her in case he returned. His face terrified and infuriated her. He'd stolen her best friend and most of her childhood and then disappeared without a trace. But Kathy knew he was out there somewhere. She knew she was the only person who could solve this case. But as the years went by, an investigator slowly lost sight of it. It seemed less and less likely that they'd catch Maria's killer. Next, a surprise confession brings a suspect out of the woodwork, nearly 40 years too late. Now, back to the story. After Maria Ridolf's body was discovered on April 26, 1958, the hunt for her murderer ground to a halt. The FBI dropped the case, leads dried up, and time went on. Kathy Sigmund graduated high school, got married, and moved out of Sycamore as soon as she could. Local and state police occasionally reopened their files in attempts to find a new angle or suspect. Each time, they failed. Decades passed, and nothing changed. By 1994, the memory of Maria Ridolf had almost faded entirely. The wanted posters for her abductor had long been covered up. Her name only came up in discussions of local history or when school kids wanted to spook each other. The residents who searched for her in 1957 generally accepted that her killer would never be found. But in January 1994, a few of them were in for a surprise. Janet Tessier was just an infant the night Maria disappeared, but it felt like she'd been haunted by the little girl her entire life. Sycamore changed after Maria was kidnapped. Fear had seeped into the town, and childhood just didn't seem as fun. But nearly 40 years had passed. Now, Janet sat next to her dying mother, Eileen Tessier, Cancer had ravaged the woman's body, and she was on heavy doses of morphine. She rarely spoke. But that day, Eileen's eyes opened wide. She grabbed Janet's wrist and delivered what seemed like an urgent message. Janet, Janet, those two little girls and and the one that disappeared, those two little girls, John did it. John did it. You have to tell someone. It didn't take Janet long to figure out what her mother was talking about. 
The two little girls were, of course, Maria Ridoff and Kathy Sigmund, and John had to be John Tessier, Janet's half-brother. It seemed her mother was implying that John kidnapped and killed Maria. It didn't seem out of the question. In fact, Janet was a little bit angry at herself for not putting it together sooner. Janet was too young to remember the night that Maria was taken, but her older siblings had told her all about the strange events of December 3rd, 1957. They lived only a few blocks away from the Riddolf house and remembered how searchers banged on the door as they cowered inside. Later, FBI agents showed up to talk to their oldest brother, 18-year-old John Tessier. John had a long face and blonde hair, which matched the description that Kathy had given of Maria's abductor, who called himself Johnny. He'd recently been kicked out of school after shoving and insulting a teacher and was in the process of joining the military. An anonymous call had pointed the FBI to John, and he was one of the first suspects interviewed. But Janet's parents said that the 18-year-old couldn't have done it because he was at home all night. The other Tessier children were confused by this. They'd been home all night, and they never saw John. They weren't sure why their mother was covering for him, but she'd always given special treatment to her eldest son. Oddly, when John Tessier was brought in for an official interview, his alibi changed. He wasn't at home, as his mother had said before. He was at the recruiting office in Rockford, signing up for the Air Force. Though John couldn't prove this entire story, at least part of it was true. He clearly was in Rockford around 7 p.m. that night. He placed a collect call from there to the Tessier home at 6.57, and Air Force recruiters in the area remembered speaking with him between 7.15 and 7.30. Federal agents confirmed the two-minute phone call. Because they were fairly certain Maria was kidnapped around 7.00, the fact that John Tessier was at a payphone miles away disqualified him as a suspect. He passed a polygraph test and was let go before the FBI could get a photo to show little Kathy Sigmund. If the FBI wanted to ask John more questions in 1957, they couldn't reach him. The 18-year-old left Sycamore soon after his polygraph test to join the military. By the time Janet heard her mother's deathbed confession in 1994, she hadn't spoken to John in years. According to Janet, the last time they interacted, he'd pulled a gun out and threatened to kill her. She cut off contact immediately after. Eileen Tessier died a few weeks later. John was not invited to the funeral. As the family gathered to pay their respects, Janet relayed the story to her siblings. At first, most of them doubted her or said she shouldn't look into it further. But Janet wouldn't give up that easily. Maria's murder still hadn't been solved, and it seemed like the FBI had taken John Tessier off the list of suspects way too quickly. It couldn't hurt to keep digging. Janet got to work. In 1994, she contacted every law enforcement agency she could and told them about her mother's confession. The FBI and the Sycamore police said that John had a solid alibi. He was cleared in 1957, and a deathbed confession wasn't enough reason to look into him again. Janet's passion faded as agencies and investigators continued to say no. After three years, she'd given up entirely. She pushed the case to the back of her mind and promised herself to reach out again after her father died. Coincidentally, soon after Janet Tessier let the case go, the Sycamore police announced they'd officially closed it. It was October of 1997, almost 40 years since the kidnapping. Police suspected they found a likely suspect in their violent offender database. The man's name was William Henry Redmond, a carnival worker and day laborer who'd allegedly kidnapped, raped, and murdered an eight-year-old girl in Pennsylvania a few years before Maria was taken. He'd also been arrested twice for assaulting preteen girls. Though this crime occurred in 1951, Redmond was charged in 1988 
That trial was dismissed due to evidence issues. Redmond died in 1992 and was never given a full trial on the murder charges. Supposedly, he mentioned abducting another child to a fellow inmate, but that comment was never confirmed. At first glance, the Ridoff case matched up nicely with the Pennsylvania murder and Redmond's other alleged crimes. He had a pattern of charming young girls, then luring them to a second location and beating or choking them unconscious before sexually assaulting them. His transient lifestyle made it easy to slip away. Sycamore might have felt a bit of relief when they saw that the killer came from outside and wasn't one of their own. This relief was short-lived. Only a few days after the police department's triumphant announcement, an op-ed piece in the Daily Chronicle started poking holes in their argument. On November 21, 1997, the editorial board published the piece, which questioned the police's real motives. They were especially critical of Police Lieutenant Patrick Soler, who supposedly closed the case. News of the case's closure has made a big splash in Sycamore. However, Solar's investigation does not hold water. No evidence has been presented that Redmond was ever in Sycamore. But Solar apparently believes that simply because Redmond was a truck driver, he could have come through town. Why, after 40 years of being an unsolved case, has Solar stepped forward now? Simple. He wants to be the next Sycamore police chief. Regardless of Solar's motivations, the case against William Henry Redmond was weak, and because Redmond had been dead for five years, there was hardly any way to get new information. Hope quickly soured into cynicism. It seemed evident that Maria's real killer would never be found. The police department had officially given up and might even have used her as a political pawn. But Janet Tessier refused to follow the town's lead. She was ready to make one final push to investigate her half-brother, John Tessier. She discovered that he used a different name now, calling himself Jack Daniel McCullough. Maybe this new name would finally push the detectives into action. On September 11, 2008, Janet wrote an email to the Illinois State Police. She desperately hoped that it would be her last. Sycamore, Illinois. December 1957. A seven-year-old child named Maria Ridolf vanished. Her remains were found in another county several miles away in early spring of 1958. I still believe that John Samuel Tessier from Sycamore, Illinois, a.k.a. Jack Daniel McCullough, was and is responsible for her death. He is living in the Seattle-Tacoma, Washington area under the name Jack Daniel McCullough. I've given information to the person responsible for the cold case in Sycamore. I've done this a few times. Nothing is ever done. This is the last time I mention this to anyone. What information I do have makes Tessier McCullough a viable suspect and worth looking into. I'm not going to keep doing this over and over. It's exhausting and it dredges up painful, horrible memories. This time, it worked. The case was eventually assigned to a pair of Illinois State Police special agents, including Officer Brian Handley. Handley jumped on the case and tracked down all of Janet's siblings to gather more information on the man who now went by Jack McCullough. All of the Tessiers hated their half-brother, and with good reason. The detective was especially disturbed by his conversation with Janet's older sister, Jean Tessier. The woman said that her older brother forced her to watch him molest other girls. Though Hanley couldn't confirm Jean's claims, it sure gave him reason to keep going. He reviewed all of the available information on Jack's whereabouts on the night of December 3rd, 1957, and contacted additional witnesses who knew him at the time. The man's alibi had been enough to get him off the hook in 1957, but some things didn't add up. For one, Jack claimed to have been in Chicago and Rockford all day on December 3rd, speaking with military recruiters. But someone saw his car driving around downtown Sycamore that afternoon. It was a Pontiac with painted on flames, so it was unmistakable. <laughs> 
Jack also claimed that he met up with his girlfriend around 9 p.m. that night and then joined in on the search for Maria with a classmate from high school. Neither of those people saw him that night. The recruiters themselves also noticed Jack acting strange on December 3rd. He seemed twitchy and nervous, and one recruiter thought he was on illegal drugs. Hanley also found that the day after the abduction, Jack met with another military official. This person noted that Jack had a cut on his lip that appeared fresh and made small talk about Maria's disappearance. According to an FBI interview, Jack also bragged to the recruiter that he wouldn't be seen as a suspect because his girlfriend's father worked in the sheriff's department. He showed the recruiter a small notebook where he marked down the names of local girls, complete with their hip and bust measurements. The most confounding piece of evidence was still the phone call he'd made from Rockford around 7 p.m. on the night Maria was kidnapped. Even though the call placed Jack outside of Sycamore at the time of the abduction, Hanley wasn't sure that wrote him off. There were some conflicting accounts of what time Maria was taken, and the 7 p.m. timestamp mainly existed because Kathy Sigmund asked the abductor for the time before she ran to get her mittens. A few witnesses saw Maria and Kathy outside by themselves between 6.05 p.m. and 6.30. Two other separate witnesses a delivery boy and a bus driver, saw no one at the corners of Archie Place and Center Cross Street around the times they passed through, 6.20 and 6.30 respectively. The kidnapper could have given Kathy an incorrect time on purpose and taken Maria closer to 6.15. The drive from Sycamore to Rockford was about 45 minutes. If he timed it right, John could have made it to a payphone on the outskirts of Rockford by 6.57 p.m. and left Maria in the trunk while he talked with the recruiters. It was unlikely, but not impossible. More than 50 years had passed since Maria Ridolph's case went cold. Now, in 2008, it seemed like it was finally heating back up. <laughs> 